The following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on April 17th, 2021. 6.27 a.m. Did you know that they have duck boat tours in Ireland, but they're called Viking Splash Tours? I did not know that, but I would be at least twice as likely to do a Viking Splash Tour as I would a duck boat tour. Did the Vikings attack Dublin? Apparently, yes. The first Viking Age in Ireland began in 795, when Vikings began carrying out hit-and-run raids on Gaelic Irish coastal settlements. Ooh, I actually know something about this. A Norseman named Citric or Sigtrig ruled Dublin, and then eventually Northumbria. I have no idea when, but it was a thing. Probably in the 9th century. That was a good time for different people to be in charge around Europe. Close! Appears to be early 10th century. His nickname was Silkbeard. He fought a battle at Island Bridge in Ireland. Is that an island with a bridge leading to it, or a nonsense? A bridge made of islands? I don't know, but I like it. He also has a grandchild named Ivar of Limerick. Had a grandchild. I assume they're all dead. All the great ones are. Which should be encouraging because it means that you and I will someday have a chance to be great as well. I do plan on dying at some point. While we're living, the best that anyone can aspire to be is Paul Rudd. Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the Brothers Drew Yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about duck boats, maybe we'll talk about Vikings, maybe we'll talk about islands made of bridges, or bridges made of islands. But we haven't planned our exact course yet because we want you to join us on that journey. That's how it works on Things I Text My Brother. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But before we examine today's text topics, we want to go back as we always do and look at the things we might have gotten wrong or anything we might have learned more about. It's time for ablutions and edification. So unfortunately, in our last conversation around Denvo Curry and, and his missing vocal cords, I brought up a conversation about the power of myth. And uh, I said that I watched that on NPR, which would be quite the trick. I indeed watched it on PBS. I feel cleansed. Yeah, I mean, there is a great shame in confusing the two pillars of NPR and PBS. And I hope you felt stupid initially, but I'm also glad that you've addressed that now. I made no errors in the last episode, at least none that our giant audience has told us about yet. So I have nothing of which I need to cleanse myself. Do you have other terrible mistakes you'd like to fess up to? I feel like I've taken my beating. I'm ready to move on. Excellent. And in terms of edification, uh, I think it's a mathematical reality. Is it possible to be more than perfect, Brad? I got 105% on a test once, so I'm going to say yes. I guess you're probably right. But in this case, there's nothing else we can learn until one of you audience members teaches us something. So no edification for any of you today and none for us as well. I think that takes care of this week's ablutions and edification. There's always a chance for more next week, so send us any mistakes that you caught us making or any additional information that you might have on any of these topics, and we'll add that to one of our future episodes. But today, we have a bunch of stuff in front of us, and we could go any number of directions. What do you want to talk about first? I want to know how many times in your day job you have mm. taken a duck boat tour, and maybe you should explain what a duck boat tour is to our audience in case they don't know. Ah, uh, that is definitely a good question, because in my day job, I've taken many a group to Boston, and anybody who's spent time on the streets of Boston knows that if you cross enough intersections, there's going to be big, funny-looking trucks that look like boats on wheels, because they're boats on wheels, and the people inside are going to be quacking at you because their obnoxious tour guides tell them to do so. That's what a duck boat is. They're these World War II amphibious vehicles that were made to take troops and supplies from the water up onto land for beach landings or whatever the case may be. After the war or various wars end, many of them end up living different lives and, and a number of them as tour boats in cities across the world, some which still have them, some which no longer use them. 
I've done them in Boston probably a couple dozen times. They're a fun experience and a chance to learn history and be kind of goofy as you're doing it. That's me and duck boats. On any of your duck boat tours, did you travel with the famous Captain Weird Beard? They were all Captain Weirdbeard. I can't distinguish any of them from all their characters are really kind of funky, crazy types. Do you feel lucky that you're still alive after having gone on these duck boat tours? Because They've I've had, had some incidents, haven't they? No, since 1999, there have been 41 people who have died on duck boat tours in various places. For bike riders killed by duck boats, walkers killed by duck boats. It's a dangerous game. Duck boats have also caught on fire. Um, <laughs> duck boats have sank in the middle of the water. I think the most famous incident happened a few years ago when the one in, what was it, Missouri or Arkansas? It was one in Branson. Know, sank in the, in the storm in kind of a yeah, bigger think... body of water, which then I think all the other duck boat companies that operate on little canals and tiny rivers were saying, we're not taking this out into the middle of, of the Atlantic Ocean or something. So they shouldn't face the types of waters that caused that incident. But yeah, a number of the other things like where they're hitting people at traffic lights because of blind spots that they have, duck boats have a, a little bit of a sketchy record. For me personally, they were always very enjoyable, very fun. I had a good time. I would gladly go on them again. In Boston, they used to let the passengers drive. And so the, I think the most <laughs> dangerous thing was you'd get out on the water and suddenly there was an eighth grader named Tucker cruising you around in between people who were taking sailing lessons 50 feet away from you <laughs> and all the other just boat traffic under the aging bridges of the Charles River in Boston. I don't think they were doing that anymore when I last took a duck boat tour. So maybe wisdom has prevailed. Well, it seems very Viking because they start out young. But uh, Branson, <laughs> speaking of Branson, uh, one of my favorite just random events from a Simpsons episode is they're on a bus and they're trying to get to Branson and they stop at this place and they open the bus door and one of the Simpsons characters says, is this Branson? And you pan to this woman and her baby who both look like Charles Bronson. And the baby says, nah, this is Bronson. <laughs> uh, anyway. Do you know where the first duck boat tour was? Wisconsin, in the Wisconsin Dells, which I've not been to, but that's where it was. Bob Unger, 1946. Yeah. Do you know how duck boats got their name? I do know that it came from GM, General Motors Manufacturing Codes. I've seen and heard some different actual descriptions about exactly what each letter meant according to the GM code. Do you have that? Now, what I have is that it was D-U-K-W. D was the model year, 1942. U stood for utility vehicle. K meant all-wheel drive, and W meant dual rear axles. And shockingly, the W got dropped, and they just kept it calling them ducks. Quacktastic. I didn't get too far into this, so I'm, I'm hoping that you maybe did. Yeah, the history of the D-U-K-W that we all know as duck boats, or apparently in Dublin we would know as Viking Splash Tours, it's really interesting because it came about very quickly to meet needs from World War II. I'm going to take out a lot of names and dates and things that would kind of bog us down here in this podcast, but I took much of this story from a Smithsonian Magazine article by a guy named Thomas B. Allen. So it all goes back to the spring of 1942, a major general in the United States Army reaches out to this guy who ran an independent science research and development company. He was an MIT graduate. He says, can you come up with something to help us get our light tanks across the water for these beach landings? And the science guy, he's kind of thinking, I can do one better than that. I can design you a vehicle because secretly he'd already been working on such things that will do all of that. You can drive it out into the water, uh, roll on up to the beach and literally roll onto the beach, deliver those men supplies and even take things back out to the boats. He reaches out to General Motors. Interestingly enough, I kept thinking General Mills. They had no involvement in this, although I'm sure they were involved in the war effort somehow. But General Motors sits down, they basically go to work for a week, they do work over the weekend, and they're actually able to generate a prototype made out of wood, sheet metal, and cardboard in about a week. This is that DUKW prototype. They have to basically take this vehicle chassis and then they have to make it float. So they reached out to a guy who ran a naval architectural firm, who by the way, had also won the America's Cup at some point and said, can you help us make our truck float? 
And he rigged it up so that it could do that. Eventually, with the efforts of all these GM engineers, the Army, the former MIT scientists, the former America's Cup winner, they generate this vehicle that they test out in the lake near Pontiac, Michigan. And it worked. It worked very well. They could drive it on land at about 50 miles per hour, five or six miles per hour in water. And it was said by the guy who had won the America's Cup, she's better in water than any truck and she'll beat any boat on the highway. They produce some of these. They're trying to actually convince the higher ups in the military to go forward with these. So originally they produced 2000 of them. The army doesn't show great interest. A guy named Patton shows a little bit of interest. He says, send me all of them you can. He's over in Africa at the time. So he gets sent some. Eventually we send some other ones for the naval landings in Sicily. Um, they are used in the D-Day invasion as well. But before all that, the people who had generated this vehicle had to convince the government that it was worth investing in. And so they assigned somebody from the OSS, the intelligence agency, to create a documentary about the boat that would convince the higher ups to give it approval so they could produce a bunch of them and so that it didn't just end up kind of sitting in warehouses in Detroit. Some 90 military officers and civilians were invited to a demonstration off Provincetown, Massachusetts on Cape Cod in the first week of December 1942. The plan called for DUKWs to unload a ship and carry her cargo and land. Then, on the night of December 1st, a storm of near-hurricane force hit Provincetown. As it happened, the Coast Guard yawl Rose, conscripted for wartime, was watching for German U-boats. As Rose made for port, winds of 60 miles per hour slammed her onto a sandbar where she began to break up. Wind and waves turned back rescue boats, and a desperate Coast Guard officer who knew about the gathering of DUKWs thought that they might be the answer. One of the DUKWs was loaded up with a photographer, and then it roared down the beach, plunged into the surf, and headed for the Rose. Maneuvering the DUKW alongside the foundering craft, they picked up the seven-man crew and returned to shore. The photographer headed for his studio, printed the dramatic photos, sent them to Washington to a high-ranking army official, and suggested that he might want to show them off to the Navy. Everybody was impressed, including President Roosevelt. So that's it. They later were, were able to demonstrate in 10-foot waves that it was also successful in unloading cargo and gun batteries from the ship in a good amount of time, howitzers, men, all that stuff. And eventually, the DUKWs were put into production. On D-Day, the first of some 2,000 of them began delivering combat and support troops along with supplies to Normandy's beaches. Out in the Pacific, they were used as well, and the Marines at first were kind of scoffing at them when they saw them drive by. They were just quacking at them like you would do in Boston. But then these boats that they had been making fun of started turning around and taking their injured brothers back out to the hospital ships. And very quickly, the Marines' attitude toward them changed a great deal. They ended up having this track record of being very useful and were actually deployed again in the Korean War and in other smaller conflicts that we don't talk as much about. By the time that these fleets of duck boats were retired, they had a pretty good track record, quite a bit more impressive than the fires and the dragging of people on scooters and the hit pedestrians that they have accumulated in more recent years. The story of the duck as a military boat is far more fascinating than I would have ever imagined. They really do have a military history that is legit. All I can do is keep singing Modern Major General from the Pirates of Penzance since you mentioned Major General. I am the very model of a modern major general. I have information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England and I quote the heights historical from Marathon to Waterloo in order categorical. I can't get it out of my head now. Thank you very much. I don't know anything about that. Well, you're missing out because that's a great song. <laughs> so there's a connection then, obviously, from the duck boats being used in Normandy to the Irish calling them Viking splash tours because, you know, the Vikings were all over Normandy. They were all over that part yeah. of France, right? And oh, William sure. the Conqueror, who then took over England at some point in 1066 and all that. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you, though. Here you are in Dublin, right? Having no, I'm, these Viking... I'm, I'm actually, I'm in Ohio. Thank you. So here you might be in your mind in Dublin <laughs> taking this Viking boat tour, right? If they're still in operation. So you're Which taking this we, we know we should mention that they shut things down for the pandemic. And I don't know that they have or intend to reopen. We'll leave that as a question for the universe to answer. But anyway, where were you going? Yeah, so you've got Dublin. The Vikings came in and took it over for a while in the late 700s through the 900s or however long they lasted there. And so now you're a modern Dublin person and you're riding on Viking boat tours. I was trying to think of what an equivalent might be. Like in Paris, they might be riding around in chariots after the Romans had taken over and then mm -hmm. left. 
in Cleveland, you might be riding in Ford Broncos because you were defeated by the Denver Broncos on a regular <laughs> basis. Although we've never beaten them in the, to get to the Super Bowl. So I don't too know. Too soon. Too it'll, soon. It'll always be too soon. I... I went to Denver on a conference at my job. How dare you? And I was uh, standing across a highway from Mile High Stadium. And I, I did, I admit, start yelling obscenities at the stadium. I couldn't help myself. And this old yeah. guy starts walking by and he looks at me. And I said, I'm, fr- I'm from Ohio. And he says, carry on. <laughs> Can you think of any other equivalents? Because that that just fascinated me that they so they're we're basically the saying... Vikings who beat them and the French would be celeb you know verse what was his name verse uh, Ver- I never know how to works. pronounce it yeah. yeah yeah and you know he he got beaten up by the Romans and now they'd be riding in chariots I don't know yeah well if we're doing things in sporting terms it'd be as if there was a boat tour in Ann Arbor Michigan which was celebrating all things of the Buckeyes who have conquered them. That could happen too. I don't know what they would yell. I don't know, but they what would they be riding around in a giant buckeye? Yeah, they'd ride around in a giant buckeye helmet or a giant buckeye leaf, or several Brutus the Buckeyes would carry would walk around carrying them on their shoulders. <laughs> I like that. Which would I be love, fantastic. <laughs> I like that. So I was thinking a little bit about Sig Trigger and his uh, movement from Dublin into England, into Northumbria, which is the name Northumbria comes from North of the Umber, just in case you ever wondered. Do you know what an Umber is? An Umber is a river oh, in, okay. uh, in Northern England. So they had Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, and Wessex. I have watched quite a few shows about Vikings and read a few series about Vikings. So this is a time period I'm a little bit knowledgeable of. But I was looking at Island Bridge in Dublin, which is a place, it's a bridge that goes over the River Liffey. And I like the name River Liffey. So I was looking at other rivers in Ireland. And the only one that I really liked is they have a river in Ireland called the River Suck. (laughs) And I liked that that a lot. Yeah. There's also an island, which I knew before. Alfskars Island, or Isla Craig is what it is now. And uh, that's where all the curling stones and major, major hmm. real curlers, all the curling stones are made from blue hone micro granite on this little island between Ireland and Scotland that has yeah. a Viking name. I also went down this path because I was thinking about Vikings and you've got Ragnar Lothbrok and Bjorn Ironsides and Harold Bluetooth and Harold Finehair and Harold Wartooth and some non-Heralds, Olaf the Brash, Eric Bloodaxe, Sigurd Snake in the Eye. <laughs> you got all these great Viking names. And so I said, well, I wonder what Lodbrok, Ragnar Lodbrok stands for. And since mm-hmm. he's the character that's in all these books and, and movies, it actually means hairy breeches. Yep, Harry Breeches. I saw that too. And I also read that he had to design Harry Breeches because he needed to fight a dragon. What do you need when you got to fight a dragon? You definitely need some shaggy breeches to fight a dragon. So that all makes perfect sense, right? Well, I thought, I I read that it was to keep away venomous snakes, but since there are no snakes in Ireland because St. Patrick scared them all away, Mm. that he certainly didn't end up in Ireland. I read that uh, Ragnar with the shaggy breeches, his son one of his sons, Ivar the Boneless. Yeah. They're not entirely sure what boneless meant. Like, did he have a brittle bone disease? Some said that maybe he was impotent. But either way, it seems a little bit rude to be taunting Ivar by calling him the boneless because he's breaking his legs or has other issues. Why they got to pick on Ivar? I, I don't know. But I did find an Old Norse nickname book. It's, the, it's called Old Norse Nicknames. by. It's a dissertation by Paul Peterson of the University of Minnesota. 280 pages that goes Mm. into how all of these Norse nicknames came about. And there's a whole section on name calling as (laughs) reasons for it. And uh, my favorite was there was a very tall, athletic, very well-built Viking, and they called him the short. And I can only assume that was because either someone really hated him when they were writing about him, or they they appreciated irony uh, at that time. And some of it is is much more straightforward, because I'm assuming that Sven Forkbeard had a forked beard. But maybe Sven Forkbeard was much like Jeff Druyer, and he can't really even grow facial hair. So if somebody were to call me Jeff Forkbeard, that would seem cruel. There's just, you know, there's some great nicknames across, not just in the Vikings, but across all the rulers. I wonder how many of them were actually used to their faces and how much of it <laughs> is uh, after the fact. Like there's Ivalo, the Tsar of Belgium. His nickname was Cabbage. And they said that <laughs> his, that actually was his nickname when he was alive. He was a peasant. And his huh? nickname when he was a peasant was actually Cabbage. And then huh? when he fought his way up to Tsar, he just kept the nickname. 
So they called him Cabbage, you know. And then you've got <laughs> Ivan the Terrible, Bloody Mary, all these different nicknames, and mm-hmm. you know Charles the Simple. So how many times did they actually use those nicknames? But that whole genre of nicknames for all these people all over the place just fascinates me. Yeah, they definitely had some good names. And these are the people who the original question in the text was, I feel we'd be remiss if we didn't mention. I asked the question, did the Vikings attack Dublin? And in a greater unspoken question was, did the Vikings spend a bunch of time in Ireland was what I was asking. Now, you would have known the answer to that. You did know the answer to that. And you said that. Ireland was basically Viking central for several hundred years there between the 8th century and the 11th century. And it started out with these small bands, maybe two or three of these Viking boats come over and they would just be, you know, quick hit and run. They'd come in, they'd float their Viking boats, which were not World War II military amphibious vehicles. Uh, They'd float them up to shore. They'd attack quite often a monastery or something like that because they found out there were good relics there and they were pagans. So they didn't have that code of not attacking the church. They take what they need and they just take it back on home and sell it off like we see in the incredible program, Norse Men, which everybody should watch. But then they scaled the operations up and they started showing up with 50 or 100 uh, Viking ships. They'd pull up, they'd set up a camp. In fact, that's Dublin is kind of that story. It was a small settlement beforehand, but really the Vikings kind of created Dublin by showing up there, turning it into a big camp that ended up remaining as a settlement afterwards. But many of these camps they would stay in for a month, a couple months a year and they would raid the entire countryside from these camps so yeah they were there and i feel dumb for not having known that well it's it's amazing if you look at it right the vikings everybody thinks of them as these warrior marauders and they were right and they attacked and they did things but they came they conquered then they stayed and made lives for themselves like i said yeah normandy Brittany, that was all old norse vikings and then you had ireland and they were there parts of especially the north and the uh east of of what's england right they never conquered mm-hmm. wales they never conquered scotland really they had dane land between northumbria and east anglia all that area but just as the english kicked them out a french-speaking viking from normandy took it all Oh, those Vikings. They were almost certainly not wearing horns on their helmets. What were they wearing? I have done no research on this, but Brad, let me ask you the question. What, if anything, were the Vikings wearing on their heads? Not hairy breeches. (laughs) Fair enough. So let me ask you, if you were to go on an amphibious adventure to a far off land and conquer the natives, what helmet would you choose to wear? I would wear something that had big horns on it, like mountain goat, you know, big curly horns that go around. They don't stick out on the top. They go around your side like Tim the Enchanter from... They call him Tim? So you're saying you're not wearing a Minnesota Vikings Viking helmet. You're wearing an L.A. Rams helmet. Yes, good job remembering they're in L.A. now. Are they in L.A.? I was thinking of that as I said it. Yes, they are. They are. Yes. Uh Uh-huh. The other thing that I mentioned in the text exchange, which is probably near and dear to the hearts of many in contemporary society, is that, you know, we as humans can all aspire to something. And perhaps a a dream of yours might be for somebody in this world to aspire to be Brad Dreher someday, or at least to exhibit the qualities of Brad Dreher. I don't even aspire to be that. (laughs) I don't even aspire to be Brad Dreher, just so you know. Oh, well. Well, you, just like the rest of us, could aspire to a higher being then. And the one that I specifically mentioned was Paul Rudd. I stand by that statement. That's not one that we'll have to do any ablutions on or anything like that. If anyone is lacking evidence, and I don't know who you are or why you have this affliction that you don't understand the value of a Paul Rudd. If somehow you find yourself to be the human uh, in at least American contemporary society who doesn't understand Paul Rudd, I would like to direct you toward the search engine of your choice, where you should enter the words Paul Rudd, and let's say, you spin me round. Now, I think many of you probably know the song by Dead or Alive from 1985, You Spin Me Right Around. Paul Rudd and James Fallon have done a, not just scene by scene, but second by second remake of the video from 1985. It involves 80s tease hair and eye patches, It is an absolute treasure. It is Paul Rudd being the genius that he is. He's also done other performances with Jimmy Fallon in the same manner. I give an honorable mention to The King of Wishful Thinking, a song from 1990. In that song, if any of you appreciate aggressive shoulder dancing, especially aggressive shoulder dancing done by people wearing tank tops, 
look no further than Paul Rudd's King of Wishful Thinking. I can't say that I have the same fascination with Paul Rudd that you do. I accept that that's who you want to be. I mean, as your older sibling, I'm hurt that you don't want to be me. But then again, neither do I. So as my older sibling, you're hurt because I spent many years attempting to hurt you. And those years aren't done yet. (laughs) I've been warned. Well, brother, there's one man who would never try and hurt either of us. He's not an ordained minister, he's never been in a video remake with Jimmy Fallon, and he has yet to acquire his menacing Viking nickname, although there is still plenty of time. We know him as Father Art, and we're going to ask him some questions. If you were an entrepreneur tasked with creating an amphibious tour to showcase a city by land and water, like the Viking Splash Tours in Dublin and the duck tours offered in many cities, what theme would you try to develop instead of Vikings or ducks? Mm, Probably a canal boat, some sort of a canal boat theme Uh, or river boat theme. I I like both of those. If you were a Viking, and you had to pick your Viking weapon of choice. Would you choose an axe, a sword, a bow? What would you be your weapon of choice? Um, probably a mace. Oh, nice. <laughs> if you could choose any Irish person or group of Irish people with whom to take an amphibious boat tour, who would you pick and why is it the chieftains? <laughs> well, it probably, probably wouldn't be the chieftains. Um, Maybe cherish the ladies because uh, I enjoy their New York accents. In a very broad sense, meaning your answer can be historical, fictional, sports related, or any topic of your choice. Who is your favorite Viking? <laughs> Boy, probably uh, Robert Smith, the running back. He, he, he would be my favorite Viking. Um, I'm not sure I have a favorite pillager. Well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything that we can say about floating trucks and menacing Scandinavian nicknames and Charles Bronson and even Rivers Suck. But fear not, there will be another episode coming your way soon. As soon as we can dig back into the archives, find another gem of a text exchange, do a little research on a Thursday afternoon, and enlighten your day just like we did this time. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you liked or what you didn't like or what you have to tell us that we can learn more about for our ablutions and edification segment. So visit all the places and hit like, subscribe, whatever you can to help other people find this little podcast and the fraternity of Drew Yards will be forever grateful. We will talk to you next time. And there's just so much I don't know. It'd be interesting if I had some outlet that I could benefit from finding random bits of information and exploring them for three to four hours on a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I just I wish there was, I wish there was something like that. Some, something to do with it. Because yeah. like, if I had something like that, then when my wife went into an Ikea, I could read. And I don't mind Ikea. You get to sit on all the furniture. It's exciting. I like it. That was good. You nailed it. I feel like we struggled in this episode. I regret that.